I say refresh, what comes to your mind? Clean air. Irish Spring. Irish Spring. <laughs> Renew. Revive. Revive. Re-energize. Re-energize. Clean. 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 <clears throat> I think beverage. <laughs> You're hot, yes. Ice refreshing, cold cup of water. ice cold cup of water, refresh. Mm -hmm. Refreshing the heart is the session title they chose. So the question we ultimately want to settle on, if you go to the very end of the handout, you'll see my reflection question. What can I do to be a source of refreshing or refreshment to others? That's where we want to end. How can I refresh others? How can I be that drink of refreshment for somebody who is thirsty or dry or needs some support? So I chose a song by Albert Orsborne. It's number 610. It's on the handout. And I'll read the first verse as it is available to you. My life must be Christ's broken bread. My love his outpoured wine. A cup or filled, a table spread beneath his name and sign, the other souls refreshed and fed may share his life through mine. Albert Osborne wrote this song at Easter in 1947. He was leading a series of meetings in Germany and Holland and felt dismayed at the problems and rifts that had been caused by World War II. He said, I cried to God to bring us together, to bridge what seemed to be in all reason an impassable gulf between our respective conditions of living. God revealed to me that we have no hope of being a blessing to other souls unless our lives become part of the Savior's consecration. Some salvationists considered the ideas expressed in this hymn to be their way of experiencing and then living out the sacrament of what some other churches term the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. The song was published first in The War Cry in 1947 and has been in the Salvation Army songbooks ever since. So that's a little bit of background on this song that I chose. I chose it because I wanted a song with the word refresh. But there's a lot more than that. Notice what he says in that second to last line. The other souls refreshed and fed. So that is part of the reason I thought of drinking when I use refresh because Osborne says other souls refresh and fed. So being fed and being refreshed are two different things. Suggesting that it's possible to be refreshed but not fed or fed but not refreshed. In other words, you could have things but not have joy or you can have joy but not have things. So that's a weak analogy on the spot to try to parse the two there. You can come to church and receive everything that's being said, but no one around you is refreshing you. The word coming from the pulpit and the communion together is feeding you, but you almost feel like you're isolated. You leave as you came. You're not refreshed. So I want to know how can we refresh each other? So let me read the session in context, and then we look at the letter to Philemon. It is while imprisoned in Rome that Paul wrote this letter to Philemon, describing him as a dear friend and a co-worker. The salutation included three individuals, Philemon, Aphia, and Archippus, the latter two very likely being his wife and his son. Our purpose today is to direct us towards the idea of being a source of refreshing for others in the faith family. But beyond that, I also want us to think about this letter as seriously as we can. The context, why it was written, and why it was included in the canon of scripture. So at some point, a council got together and decided to close the canon. Which books get included because there are many writings out there. And they had to figure, is this scriptural? Does it meet the test? They had to close the canon. In other words, okay, that's enough. And some that are included almost didn't get included. At least one. I wasn't there. <laughs> and some others didn't get included. 
And the question that I had the last night was, I wonder why this one was included. First of all, it's a confidential letter from Paul in prison to someone he met who heard him preach and became a Christian in Ephesus. And a hundred miles inland, if you can look at the map, you'll see Colossae. Paul had never been to Colossae. So it's felt that people who were converted in Ephesus the message back to Colossae because there were house churches. So your convert, whether your house is in Ephesus or in Colossae, what difference does it make? And then other house churches developed. What do we know about Philemon? Mm -hmm. Under Roman law, a slave who ran away from his master could face the death penalty. In spite of this possibility, the apostle Paul sent Onesimus, a runaway slave and a recent convert to Christianity back to his owner Philemon to make restitution. The epistle is Paul's plea that Onesimus no longer be viewed as a runaway slave, but rather as a beloved brother. Obedience to these requests would require forgiveness and restoration, actions which no other slave owner would have, would have to contemplate in the ancient world. But Christians are called to a higher calling, one that contradicted the expectations of the culture at large. While the world pursued power and glory, Christians were to pursue the way of the cross, the way of forgiveness, servanthood, suffering, and love. Two weeks ago, when we were talking about the letter to Titus, I danced around the idea that Paul could have taken a stronger stance against slavery, but what we said was there were so many other issues that were priority that he did not. I was speculating, of course. He didn't take a stronger stance. Two weeks ago, the individual who read, somebody read, bond servant. And I was appreciative of the phrase bond servant rather than slave because some people would sell themselves into slavery to pay off a debt. I can't pay you. Can I work for you for X number of years? So there were different levels, I guess. It was not chattel slavery where you were property, but it was a bond. Still, it was a form of commitment that could include punishment. And what this Bible says is under Roman law, I should start with the Greeks, but we were in the Roman era then. A slave who ran away from his master. If you're not a Roman, crucifixion. Onesimus was the one who ran away from Philemon. Philemon could have reported him and when captured, he could have been crucified. He fled somehow to Rome, and he met Paul, and he got converted. Ah, oh, man. Paul has to deal with the idea now. What do we do about this? We're going to read the scripture so that we get a better context, because there's a lot more than I've said in that particular chapter. But again... One of the questions I kept asking is, why is this in the canon? Why is a confidential letter from Paul to Philemon canonized? It must be so that we can benefit from it. That the Christian church going forward will benefit from it. So we're going to pray, and then we'll read the letter to Philemon. The curriculum calls for us to read to verse 21. The other three verses are a postscript. So whether you read it or not, you don't lose much. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. Also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. And to the church that meets in your home. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, Although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, 
yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Postscript. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. It's what we call nowadays a big ask. You're saying, I recognize that this guy has run away. I recognize that the penalty under Roman law could be that he be executed, crucified. He wants to come back. Please take him back. But don't take him back as a servant. Take him back as a fellow brother. Because he has been here with me and he's been so useful to me while I'm in chains. I'm sure he'll be very useful to you as well. His heart is inclined towards being considerate and kind. He's a convert now. So he's a fellow brother. So let's take a look at the questions I put together. Question number one, what does Paul say? What words does Paul use when describing Philemon? Beloved brother and a fellow worker. Yes. In my Bible. Okay. Any other... This says friend. Dear, friend. dear friend, co-worker, co-worker. Why might these be appropriate words to use? He's describing what he felt his character was. He's reporting to him. What makes this appropriate for the faith community? As we are a part of the faith community, why is this a good model or style, or is it, for the faith community? Well, he's appealing to him on their relationship. Mm. So in our faith community, why, why would this be an appropriate style? That they share the faith. They, they share... Today, today, us. We're grounded in the faith. Well, we're one body. Okay. What she said. Family. You need to get to the place where you feel like, yeah, we are co-workers, we are dear friends. We don't immediately get there, but that's the goal. Mm -hmm. That people don't leave, as I said, feeling fed but not refreshed. And the refresh might be a hug or a pat on the back. Mm -hmm. Something. It's refreshing mm -hmm. to be noticed. I heard something over here. and Cynthia wants Friend. She said friend. Yeah, I was also going to say, I think it's important because he is saying to um, the person he's writing the letter to, describing him in ways that he may have never seen him or thought about him before. Mm -hmm. 
And so he's letting him know, I know you've never seen him this way, but I need you to know how I see him. And he's using terminology that would resonate to the body of work that, the body of Christ, and the body of work that goes on in the body of Christ. And the example I thought in my mind is, if someone came into our classroom in um, street clothes, just like what I have on today, and we knew nothing about them, and they sat down and they participated in Sunday school, but all of a sudden someone who knows them stood up and introduced them as the former um, general secretary of the Salvation Army. I'm not picking on you, I'm just saying, if they did that, then we would be like, wow, oh, we have this in common. Or we know this about, we can assume this about that person, their knowledge, their faith, their whatever, and we would not have looked at that person that way before, but we would now look at them in a particular way because of their commitment to the work in the body of Christ. Now, Philemon knew Onesimus. In this relationship, Paul is coming between the two of them to link them together. The bridge. And that relationship. He's saying, I know you view him this way. And I know he ran away. He wants to come back. Can you view him this way? So not like a cohesive. So, and that's why we talk about koinonia in the Christian church. That's the origin of the idea of Christian fellowship. Yes, I might be in Rome and somebody might be in another part of the world, but we are all one community. We have something in common. And I have to tell you without sounding biased, that that's one of the things I love about the Salvation Army. When I left Barbados on a Friday, on a Sunday, I had a church family. But yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. you want to feel as though you're part of something, a community, that wherever you go, people are going to be welcoming. If they think, they know that you're part of the family. Koinonia obviously has a lot more to it than that, but the idea is community, and it's found in this particular letter in verse 7. I guess we're not going to get a lot more done. I said this will require an hour and a half. I'm not lying when I tell you that. How did the good reports of Philemon's ministry reach Paul? We don't know. We don't have to speculate. Right. The letter got... How did... How does Paul know what Philemon is doing back in Colossae? He is in prison in Rome. How does he know? By a letter. Delivered to him. Or reports. Or reports. So maybe people left Colossae and said, oh, by the way, you know. Or when Onesimus shows up, people who were also from Colossae say, yeah, we know your master. <laughs> He's a good man. So word of And mouth. Paul, word of yes. Mouth. So Paul converted him. But then Paul left Ephesus. He went back home to Colossae. But he was now a leader. There was a church established in his house. Partly because, as a wealthy man, he had a big house. <laughs> so it's expedient that a church could be established there. But that, com that church community was viewed as a thriving community. And I want to say he is a leader in that community. Many years ago, I preached on this idea. Because, by the way, I should have told you that the letter to the Colossians and the letter to Philemon are said to have been brought from prison by the same a man, uh, what's the word? A manusus. Um, thank you, a manusus. The same person, what, by hand, the same person delivered these two letters. Hey, you're going to Colossians, to Colossae? Hand this letter to Philemon when you get there. He lives there. This little personal letter. So this is the letter written to the church at Colossae, and this is the personal letter to Philemon. They were delivered at the same time. There are four books in the Bible that Paul wrote from prison, and those are two of them. Comment? Okay. So back to where we were. The, how did they get the good reports? Other people came. I wanted to mention the name of the pastor 
I think, the pastor. I used to say Epaphras, and a few months ago, Mary said Epaphras, and I said, I stand corrected. Potato, potato, Epaphras, Epaphras. Different preachers call it different ways. And if you were to go on Google, both pronunciations are acceptable. But Epaphras was with Paul at this point in time. In fact, you don't have the postscript included, so I'm cheating here. Verse 23. He says, Epaphras sends you greetings. So he is there with Paul. So Epaphras and Onesimus and Luke and Demas and a few other people are there. It's house arrest. So he's probably like chained to a Roman soldier. He can live in his house, but he can't leave kind of like an ankle bracelet nowadays. Can't get very far. Because remember, he is there because he appealed to Rome. When he was back in, when they were trying to, I don't want to go into too many details, but when he appealed, remember the governor was saying he did nothing wrong. We could let him go, but he's appealed to Rome. So they had to send him to Rome for the emperor to hear his case. So it was like, okay, help me, what's that call when you get arrested but you're not yet tried and arraigned? Yeah, so he appealed to Rome and that's why he's there. Anyway, keep continuing. And I know, Judge, that you could help us with the context here. <laughs> so that's you're speculating. Speculating? Yeah, let's go to question number three. <laughs> we have 10 minutes. <laughs> we have 10 minutes. Yeah, let's run through it. Number three. How did Paul pray for Philemon? Verse 6. How did Paul pray for Philemon? I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. That's a very powerful line. Yeah. Yeah. It'll take time for you to unpackage that. And I say that for homework, I want you to look at verse 6 again. I pray that your partnership with us and this faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. The word partnership is the NIV's translation of the koinonia. The communion, the sharing, the fellowship. Many other translations say communication. In fact, communication is the most popular word. Sharing. Communication. But partnership is the word we have. And I like the word partnership because when you think of a partnership, you think you have to work together in a partnership. Marriage is a partnership. Businesses that get incorporated can be partnerships. A legal partnership. But partnership. If the partners aren't working together, then one is trying to take advantage of the other. That's not a partnership. It's going to fail. Marriage is a partnership. Partnership. <laughs> so he's appealing. She now discusses with you later. <laughs> so back on track here. I don't mean to sound sacrilegious, but Paul is trying to ensure that the result is had. And he is saying, you know, we are in partnership. We are in relationship. I might not be close to you, but I want you to look at what we have in common and do this thing that is not done. Pardon someone who ran away, who could be executed, and treat him as a brother. This is a big ask. I know it's a big ask, but I really, 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 really want you to do it. Yes. Is it manipulative in some aspects? No, because in scripture, I'm going to avoid answering that question. Uh, he's no. writing a urging. Yeah. He's urging. A plea. A plea. A plea. He's, it's a plea. Yeah. But he's been complimenting him throughout this. And um, he's building his... Yeah, building him up. Mm -hmm. to now, he was, Paul converted him. 
Right, but he's he's, he's congratulating him on you know on being a dear friend and being a beloved brother and a fellow worker, and we're in a partnership. He's trying to make him as a peer. I think I think so, because all of that is true. It's not false. Mm -hmm. There's no false so manipulation um, compliment when, when in there. So he's using facts to persuade. He's focusing on what we have in common. Right. Mm -hmm. All the nice things I know about you. That's what we want to focus on. I'll appeal to the niceness in you. For mercy's sake, do the right thing. Yes. And I would take it a, a, maybe a step further or differently. Not that he's appealing to the niceness. He's reminding him of who he is. In Christ. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so in the reminding, sometimes we forget mm -hmm. who we are, who we are called to be. And he's doing all of that. I don't see that as manipulation right. and or otherwise he's speaking the truth. Well my commentary on verse 6 says Paul prays that Philemon's faith will become productive in loving service mm -hmm. and effective witness through a fullness in Christ. The acknowledgement of every good thing is both a reminder of our riches in Christ and resources in the Holy Spirit and a directive to participatively receive and apply those benefits. Yes. So he's saying, this is who you are. I don't know who you think you are, but this is who you actually are in Christ. This is what you have been given. This is what not I, Paul, but Christ has called you to give and the Holy Spirit empowers you to give. I want to say that ultimately, this is the Christian foray into being against slavery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. So we talked about that two weeks ago, why Paul didn't take a stronger position. He's thought about it. He's thought about it. He says, you know, I have an opportunity. I have an opportunity to take a stand. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do, use this one-on-one -on -one case. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think, since we only have a few minutes left. We have an hour and a half, remember? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember. Um, verse 6 and verse 17. Yes. Go together. Mm -hmm. And in verse 17, Paul is taking a position as Christ would have taken a position. Mm -hmm. Onesimus, you owe, you can't pay, I'm going to pay on your behalf, I'm going to cover the debt. Mm -hmm. Heard what she said? Mm -hmm. That's the right answer. Mm -hmm. What she said. Yeah. What Christ did for us. Right. So. If I were to alter this, I'm do for you. oh man, this is not away. Jesus yeah. interceding yeah. on our behalf mm -hmm. so that we can become part of the family of God. Right. For God so loved the whole wide world that He gave His one and only Son to die, so that we can all come into. So you want to change that that end one to me? And the other one over here to God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Amen. Amen. Put Cynthia up there. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in the same All right. Don't, yes. Don't encourage him. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let him All right. <laughs> I was discussing this with Cynthia earlier. Verse 5, I probably don't have time for this. I probably don't. Oh, verse 8, sorry. Note how verse 8 begins yeah. with a therefore. Usually, therefore says, look back at what's been said before. But this is not one of those therefores. The subheading is Paul's plea for Onesimus. In view of what I've said, now here is the ask. So I thought of other adverbs that might be appropriate. Wherefore, mm -hmm. rather than therefore. Mm -hmm. So Bible. now, sorry? My Bible says, this is why I boldly ask. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's good. Wow, that's good. So maybe it's a colon after that then. This is, this is why I'm going to ask. I don't know. Why I boldly, I boldly ask. Why I am boldly asking a favor of you. Mm -hmm. So he's appealing to maybe verse 7. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement. Mm -hmm. Because you, brother, take it home today. You, brother, have refreshed the hearts of God's people. Whatever you do, you refresh the hearts of God's people. Remember my er earlier analogy of refreshment? Yes, water. <sighs> and, I, and, and my symbolism for refreshing? Do you mind again? Refreshing heart. If your reputation, Philemon, is one who refreshes the hearts of those in the community, can you refresh one more heart? Can you do what you do so well? Yeah towards someone who had this vertical relationship with you and treat him on a horizontal level. I know it's a big ask. I know that under Roman law this is not done. You probably have other servants who will say, hey, what's going on here? He ran away and he's being treated better than those of us who stayed. That sounds like the prodigal son, doesn't it? So we expect the same reaction like the brother, the older brother. Hey, how come you're treating him so good when he ran away? And what did the father say? Come celebrate. For this my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. I'm not putting it on the same level, but I want for you to think about it. And I wish we had more time. I really do. This is worth coming back to. So in closing. I have a Onesimus means useful or profitable. Mm -hmm. It, it that. Use. Onesimus means useful or profitable. The right. name Onesimus. The name. So Paul was saying he was useful to me in prison. Yes. He can be useful to you. Whatever wrong he did, I'm pleading with you to forgive him. It's a big ask. But let me say again, because Paul had not taken a stance against slavery, I think this was a good entree yes, right. into where we were going. And to remember when someone gets a little lost, mm -hmm. when one of us gets a little lost, how we remind yes. the person, remind them of their character, yeah. remind their friendship, and bring them back. So yeah. let's spend the last minute again on the reflect reflection question. Mm -hmm. And we might not answer it, but we want to make sure we reflect on it. What are you going to do to be a source of refreshing to someone Possibly today, encouragement to someone. And don't encourage the people who don't need encouragement. Look for someone who needs encouragement because that will be to them a drink of cold water when they're thirsty, as opposed to giving a drink of cold water to somebody who's not thirsty. Yeah. Yes? Now we take that same thing there and down below. Is, is no, no, leave that one there. That, 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 that's, that goes in. That's fine. And now the, the bottom, one of one of your sinner friends, lost below lost. there, a lost, lost person. No, no, but below the bottom. Oh, there. The next one is now Bob, and the next one is now Jesus. Okay. The center one there. I thought you were going this direction. No, but no, I'm not. Those who are lost. Because here's the link. Yes. That how do I become yes. a, a source of refreshment? How do I refresh? Yes. How do you refresh? I wish we had more time. Can we stay till 10 30? Yeah, what would we do? All right. So, can I plead the way Paul pleaded that you think about this for the next week or so? See you next Sunday. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance to think about a difficult situation, a big ask on someone else's behalf, and being the source of refreshment to other people's hearts. May we find some soul, lay some soul upon our heart and love that soul through me, Lord. And may I humbly do my part to win that soul for thee. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your spirit being with us. May we go and serve you to the best of our abilities even now, for Christ's sake. Amen.